clear that. <laughs> um, did you know this stuff is here? I don't know why it's on the uh, news page. But on the, uh, on the main Jero page, if you click news, you've got, uh, you've got Coldplay tune with an old dancer up here. You've got John Prine's uh, Hello in there, which is pretty cool. Uh, and some other stuff. Yeah. Anyway, uh, a couple, we're going to talk about the syllabus today. We're going to talk about uh, what assignments we want to do, sort of. And um, I'll give you an overview of the class. We're going to talk about some about the history and uh, some of the theories in uh, professional geropsych and go over uh, how to approach uh, criticizing uh, re reading and criticizing research papers. And it'll probably take us at least four hours. So we'll see, we'll see how much of it we actually get done today. Um, so just some course planning kind of stuff. For those of you that, that have had any experience with both, um, we were going to be in 2.30 upstairs, a smart classroom on the second floor. And we moved down here because the class started getting bigger. Now there's actually, there's about 26 people signed up for this section of the course. And there's about 30 seats in room 230, which is why I thought we were probably better off down here. But if anybody feels like there's a really good reason to be up in 230 rather than down here, we could talk about that, and we could move. It, we could move upstairs next time and be cozy. Anybody prefer two thirty for any reason? Want to say why? <laughs> <laughs> it's probably cold up there too. Can we do anything about the temperature, guys? <laughs> probably. Not. Besides the besides the. Really? Let's try to aim for something in the middle. Is that possible? Okay. This has been a problem for the 20 years I've been at SC and just about all of the, all of the classrooms. And one of the things, I think they finally like locked up all the thermostats because one of the things that will happen is one professor walks into a classroom and it's cold, so you turn it all the way up to try to heat it while you're there. So then the next class comes in and it's hot, and you turn it all the way back down and just keep, keep playing that game. Although... Overall, in the last five years or so, they tend to keep like all the rooms on campus kind of cold. Um, the school that otherwise is kind of budget conscious, I've always wondered why that's true. Aside from temperature, is there any reason to go upstairs? I have a desk. You can plug in, yeah. Okay, it might be tight, especially because we will from time to time have online people uh, sitting in with us. So I, all in favor of going up to 2.30 based on what you just heard, uh, show of hands. Everybody in favor of moving to 2.30 next session and beyond? Anybody opposed? The rest of you just don't care? <laughs> no, no, okay. <laughs> It's kind of the way the vote's been going so far on assignments, but uh. okay. So let's talk about this class. Um, before I tell you what it is, we'll tell you a couple of things that it isn't. In spite of the title, this is not a lifespan developmental psych course. This is an adult development and aging course, and probably even somewhat more of a psychology of aging course. Legend has it that when uh, Jim Buren first taught this course, the first time it was offered back in the 70s, he started with infancy, and he got to about adolescence at the end of the semester. And since it was a gerontology school, the students were kind of upset. So, so we gave up on the whole childhood and adolescence thing. I just want to mention this at the outset, because once or twice I've had some people that were really quite annoyed at the end of the course that we didn't actually do the whole lifespan thing. So we make up for all those other classes in the country that say their lifespan and have like a session and a half on everything past age 18. <laughs> so 
<laughs> um, the other thing, just make you aware of, is that this is not um, primarily a practice-oriented class in any way. This is about the, the science of psych and aging, or the science of adult development and aging. We will talk quite a bit about um, how to think about applying that knowledge to practice and policy issues. Uh, but the practice course is actually the one that I usually teach in the spring, uh, 522, which is counseling older adults and their families. So there is such a class. There's a little bit of overlap, but uh, in 522, um, we sort of review most of the normal aging content in this class in the first lecture and then go on to talk about psychopathology and aging and then counseling theories and aging and a couple of other things towards the end. Um, that's also more of a didactic course than a skills course, but does give you kind of a good overview of um, both abnormal psych and aging and, and counseling, uh, uh, counseling older adults and their families to cover both individual and kind of family systems approaches to thinking about older adults. Um, this is uh, the original intention of the, the core, and I think the ongoing intention of all the core classes, the physiology, psychology, sociology of aging, and then the policy is kind of a, is a core, but gets more into the kind of policy and, uh, and program development kind of areas, is to give you a strong sense of what normal aging is like and the content areas of the constituent disciplines of gerontology uh, so that you can work from there as you think about uh, older adults and avoid some of the mistakes that people have made um, in the past about uh, uh, thinking about aging based on only knowing uh, adults that have, uh, older adults that have serious physical or psychological problems. And um, among those three kind of constituent disciplines of physiology, psychology, and sociology, psychology is kind of in the middle in terms of content. Um, and this is um, kind of reflected in the organization of the course in the sense that over the, the next few weeks, we're going to be kind of closer to the biological end of psychology. And we're going to be talking about uh, sensation and perception and attention and memory and things that are Mostly, not entirely, but mostly studied in laboratory settings using experimental manipulation kinds of methods, um, many of which have strong conceptual roots and sometimes um, methodological um, sharing with uh, biology more so. And then towards the end of the semester, we'll be talking about things that kind of get more into uh, social psychology and, and health psychology. And so connect with, um, with social uh, sociology on that end. Um, Merle Silverstein and I in the building both have some interest in caregiving. And it's interesting, as, a, as clinical psychologists go, I'm sort of more of a social psych-oriented clinical psychologist. And uh, Merle and Vern uh, kind of consider themselves to be social psychologists coming at it from the sociology side. So there's, there's kind of uh, overlap on the the sociology side in particular. Um, we particularly focus in the course on critical thinking and teaching you how to read research papers uh, critically and then think about the connection between the research and the practice. Um, I think it's pretty typical of most fields uh, that there's kind of a, there tends to be sort of a division between the research academic theoretical arm and the services arm. And I think this is still largely true of services for older adults. Um, and I think some of the mistakes that we make both in thinking about older adults and helping older adults kind of comes out of not having a stronger uh, conceptual and, and uh, scientific uh, 